This is the Palisados Foundation. Virtus Technology, a Jamaican IT services company, has been a sponsor of the annual Calico Challenge. They specialize in IT managed services, staff augmentation, training, cybersecurity, and application development. They held an online seminar on software quality assurance that we recorded. Both students and IT professionals attended. We hope you will find it valuable and informative. So, as I outlined earlier, the journey, the, the intention and the objective is to make you guys um, understand quality assurance um, testing from the beginning, right? And to get you guys up to speed as fast as possible. Now, the mission is to help you to become a competent QA engineer. Um, I can't really say, you know, you, do you need to change your profession or whatever, but the intention is for you to get all the essential tools that you need to get in order to understand what a QA engineer um, should be. If, if it is that you guys want to ask, ask any question, go ahead and um, message in the, in, in the chat section. I hope you guys can see it on your screens as well. Okay, so as I stated earlier, I've, I'm the kind of guy that does a bunch of different things um, from performance testing, software engineering, QA, dev, DevOps. Um, I even start blogging about tech. Um, I'm an advocate for open source technology. I talk a lot and I try to train as much people as possible. So the objectives is to, one, is to show you guys what those tools are how to use those tools. So give you a basic understanding of the techniques, right? Then we're going to talk about um, the life cycle of a QA, right? How QA is important for the software development life cycle. I'll explain that term, what that means in a few. And the next thing we're going to talk about is a few tips and tricks. So these are the objectives in terms of um, what we're going to talk about in this um, presentation. So before we start, you know, digging into things, giving you guys a definition, we just want to show you that quality assurance is extremely important. Um, over the years, as more companies started to use more technology as we to, to drive different services, to drive their businesses, it requires a more complex piece of software. It requires more integration of those softwares. Those software if essentially need someone to actually verify that they're working and everything is good. Because of those demand that's going, right? That, that's growing. It results in QA becoming an extremely um, career, a, extremely viable career path for a, a millions of people. Now, from research, even though this graph is not drawn to scale, this is just a high level representation to show you like this thing is like growing. And the more companies come on, come on to use IT, the more they'll need um, technology. So this is not really, this is just a fun graph right there. But a true fact is that the average salary in the United States for QA engineer is $75,000. You can extrapolate that, understand what it means for your industry in Jamaica, but a QA in Jamaica actually makes a good amount of funds. So if it is that you were wondering if you're passionate about this field, but is there a viable option or is this a good long-term thing? Yes, it is a good long-term thing. Things will actually break and we need folks to actually verify that they're good before we release those to customers. Good so far? I'll, I'll just take like silent as content as I go along. So you guys don't really have to unmute if it is that you, you don't really want to, if it is that you don't have any objections. All right, cool. Now, let's talk about the software development lifecycle and the role of a QA. This is the first um, point. So this graph right here, or this cycle wheel, is a general overview in terms of what it is. So what I'm going to do is talk you through a ideal project. But the first thing you normally do is you plan. Once you started planning, then we move into the phase of analyzing. Is this feature making sense? Is this product making sense? Will the customer use it? And there's a bunch of business meeting that goes on during this time. 
afterwards they'll normally have the design this is where you have a bunch of folks going to a room and say okay what will this product look like you know should it be red should it be blue um how many buttons do we need what the user should be doing you know when you go to the front page what the user should see so this is where they design from many levels you have the user interface design where you design the look and feel of the application then you have the implementation design which is a whole bunch of different things but essentially at this point they're trying to see what the product is so you do like sketches the next one is the implementation this is where they actually do the work of actually making sure that this thing is being built right this is the hardcore stuff stuff is going to go wrong here they're going to mess up stuff and the application that they're building might take much time versus um, the, the optimized scenarios but the intention here is that they implement that phase Th this is the implementation phase sorry then once the implementation phase is done meaning you're ready to complete with it so when you're ready to build once you finish building this application, then you move it into step five, which is a testing and the integration. During this phase is where you do that final set of testing before you actually release it to the, the main um, user base. Now, there is a new update to, these, to this cycle where number five is prefixed to number four. What that means is that Testing is done while you're actually building the application and it's not done at the end of the process. However, this is a part where you guys become extremely important. And by you guys, I'm referring to QAs, right? Before this product goes out into the market, before this thing goes on the shelf, um, so to speak, on the web, on the internet, you want to make sure that everything is working, right? Stuff can go wrong, but the intention is to minimize you want to be the safeguard for the user base. You want to make sure that they have a good user experience. So you become more like the, the, the guy that is safeguarding to make sure that the customer's objectives are being represented and the business is also being satisfied. And maintenance, this is a phase where it's being released and then you want to make sure that updates are being made. It, during step six, QA is also important as well because each time a change gets made, you have to verify th that those are good before you move on and release it again out to the public. And so this cycle will resume. Probably the business decide that, okay, we want to improve this product. So they do another planning, then they do another analysis, then they do a design, then they do the implementation, and then they do the testing. So that is what we call the software development life cycle. It's the pattern that we as developers use to make sure that the, the steps are taken for building the application is done properly. Make sense so far? Or any questions? Okay. If, if anyone has any question, you can always unmute and then um, proceed to talk, even if I skip the actual slide. No. Let's talk about what's your role, right, in, in terms of this software development life cycle. As I just mentioned earlier, you have to remember that you are the one that is in charge of the quality. First and foremost, you, you need to be a part of the process every step of the way. What that means is that when they're doing the research, you as a quality assurance engineer need to understand, okay, we're going to build this product. What does this product mean for the users? How do I prepare to actually start the testing of this product? Because if it is that you don't know what they're building before they start building it, you then going to be, I use a better word, lagging behind. So you always want to understand what business is looking for. And by business in this term, I mean the company you're working for or the client that that company is using is is building the software for the next thing is that during that research process your role is to understand what they want from the user right what's the ultimate outcome for that particular user so if it is that we're building a website to handle food or whatever the case is you actually want to understand okay is this user base 
within the objective of the, the product that we're building. During that point, you also want to start creating the testing. So at that point, you have to ensure that you have the right amount of information, you understand what they're trying to build, and then you start designing what the test would look like while they're actually um, planning out the product or actually designing the product. Once you're, you've completed those different steps, the next thing is to understand, okay, how is it going to impact, um, what different scenarios I need to think about. So if it is that you're building the website, the team is building the website, there are issues that could actually arise if a user um, have an issue with certain things. You have to think about those conditions. And once you understand those conditions or edge cases, and by edge cases, I mean things that could go wrong when you launch, right? Say, for example, you're building the website, but the logging page needs to have something on there that business didn't think about. You as the individual need to think about it and verify. And as I stated earlier, your intention is to try as much as possible to catch those issues before they reach to your user base. Make sense so far or if this need clarification? Okay. Uh, question though. Go ahead. All right, so, you know, I'll be reading a couple books about business and you know and how we can develop a product and make it and make it reach the customers before you know anything else. And in it, they say that it should you know create what's called a minimum viable product, right? Yes. A minimum viable product is a product with not with the core features, right? So it's gonna be half bugs and you know stuff that the customers may not like, but at least it's not the problem. So would it be necessary to in, uh, involve quality assurance in building a minimum viable product? Okay, so that's, that's actually a very good point to make there. Minimum, so I'll just restate um, what, what he just mentioned. So minimum, what Colin just mentioned. So the minimum viable product is a new way of designing stuff. What they normally do is you build uh, a small section of the application and you, you have a bunch of users that you actually say, hey, we're trying this thing, we want to make sure if it's working or not. Um, pass, can you give us a feedback on it? It might not have everything that the entire user is looking for, but you want to get a feel of what they're doing. To answer that question, it's more of a yes and a no. So if it is that the company really wants this to go fast and the team is small. So say for example, there is this one QA person that they're, they're, they're trying to do a bunch of other stuff. You can let your user base know that, okay, um, we, we're currently strapped. So we can't have this QA person verifying this thing too much before releasing it. But at least the QA needs to see it and say, okay, yeah, it's fine. Let's go ahead and release it. Let's give these guys a try with a disclaimer. And that way then the QA can then use those feedback after the user has provided them to understand the scenarios that they need to, to manage. In that scenario, that is mainly a scenario where the, the business might not truly understand what the best role for the customer is. And in another scenario you know, where I'm answering this, the, the question of yes, you need a QA. So if the organization is a big organization and their reputation is important, like NCB, right? Before they actually release something out to a, a list of users, and because it involves transaction and involves a lot of critical information, you need a QA right there in front to make sure that this simple MVP product is not going to leak out any information that is important or, is not, or, or the user shouldn't be seeing. So those are the two things. You have to wait in terms of how critical this application is and the type of data that you'll be sharing with those users versus, okay, I just want to see if this product will work. And if it doesn't work, you know, you, you, you pivot and you move on to something else. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, you did. Thanks. Okay, no problem. Okay, so let's look at the representation model. Um, what this means is I'm just trying to put it in the back of your mind, like where do you sit in this complex world of the software development lifecycle? I showed you earlier that it's a bunch of stuff that you need to do. You need to be involved in this thing, that thing, and research and testing and implementation. But 
in terms of a high level, you, in terms of what your role is, this is what it essentially is. You are the one that sits between the business and the customer, right? You are the gate, you are the gatekeeper of the, the palace, whatever you want to call it if you play games, right? But essentially, you need to be the one to sign off and say, yes, this product is okay, or sign off on it with conditionality to say, yes, this product is okay, but here are the things that I want business to be aware of. If business want to go ahead and release this product after you've notified them, you've done your job, right? You, you can be the decider to say, okay, this product is not being released. What you have to do is to alert business to say, this is going to go out with the customer, but these are the issues. Are you guys okay with this? Maybe they're not okay with it, and so the development, the development will continue to fix those problems. Now, from the customer side, you want to make sure that you understand what customer base you're dealing with so you can test the application as if you're the actual customer. So come back to the state now of thinking about a bank. Remember, a bank has a mortgage, a mortgage agent, um, actual customer that comes in, and there may be like different brokers that interact with the bank. If you're the QA for a banking system, you have to understand which one of those you're actually testing for and test on behalf of those users. And once you've done that, then you can provide the appropriate information to the business. So as I stated earlier, this is extremely important. This is the primary thing you need to remember at this point, even if you forget the software development lifecycle for now. Any questions so far? Cool. Now, in terms of what your job description is, you know, a lot of people talk about, um, you know, I don't understand what I need to do to actually be successful. I'll put it simple for you, right? You actually get paid to break things, right? Technically, what I'm saying to you is, if you find the issues before the customers do, your boss will say you're awesome at your job because the, the, in terms of the cost of finding an issue when the customer reports it, the customer is going to do a bunch of stuff. They could probably go on social media and they say, hey, look at this thing. I'm sure you guys remembered when NCB did an upgrade and something happened, right? A bunch of people went online. What am I seeing on my portfolio? What am I, what is this? You understand? Everybody was upset. If you as a QA actually found those issues pre the regular customer, what's going to happen is you save the company money, you save the company time, and that's what is extremely important, including reputation. So you actually get paid to break things. So if you break it, your, your boss have confidence in you, there's more trust, and you know what happens afterwards. So if you think about your job as... Think about when you were younger, right? You actually have a small toy and you do a bunch of stuff with it. You'll try to break it. Well, if you guys are anything like me, I'm going to break stuff, right? I throw it at the wall or whatever it is. That's the intention of being a QA representative. You actually want to try and see what happens when you break it, right? You want to be the one to disrupt what the product is. You're technically friends of the developers, but your intention is to break it, right? Most folks will look at it as you giving the developers more work, but that's not your primary goal. As I go back to this chart, your primary goal is a customer, right? You have to make sure you protect the customer. And so you have to do different form of notifying them. Personally, I hate when I write code and a QA actually breaks my story. I'm like, why do you break the thing? But behind the back of my mind, I totally understand why it's important. Hi, uh, hi, Devon. Uh, we're just going through. Um, probably Ryan can message you. It's possible. Can you mute a bit? Okay. So let me talk about now the career path, right, of a QA. Because what normally happens is once you start something in life, you want to know what the roadmap looks like. You want to see what's possible. And once you know what's possible, then you can expound on that. Now, a QA, um, once you start off as a QA tester, there's a bunch of stuff you can do, but you can actually become a senior quality assurance tester. And what that means is that 
you are now presiding over a group of other testers, right? Or you're testing more complex application, right? If it is that you decide to continue on this career path as a QA tester, you can then become a quality assurance manager. Now, let me just mention that if think about the context of NCB, I hope I'm not bashing NCB. I'll, I'll probably use another company in, in a small example. So Epic, because I used to work at Epic. Yep, I used to work at Epic. <clears throat> um, Epic, essentially, there, you have a bunch of applications that we're working on. And as Rom Romain not, not actually as aware of, you, you would have a QA manager there that would actually help the QA team to make sure that the, the work is spread across the different applications or whatever it is. Or if it is that you need to test a critical system, they'll coordinate the different resources. And by coordinating the different resources, I mean making sure that your, your, your teammates in terms of the QA um, have the right time appro um, proportion to a particular job and to prioritize things accordingly. Now, if it is that you decide, okay, I'm, I'm good with QA, but you still like to break things, there's something that you call a penetration tester. Um, there's another term for it you call like hackers or, or um, vulnerability testers. <clears throat> what those guys do is actually figure out issues with a system. So it's, it, this is not even the, the direct path you need to take to get to it, but this is an option, right? The next one is in the event that you're tired of QA, right, and you want to go to develop, to become a senior developer, right? As, as I think, um, I think it was uh, Romain who went from QA tester to become a senior developer <laughs> and seemed like he didn't want to continue. Not senior, not senior. Yeah. Huh? The junior, the junior developer. Okay, yeah, so junior developer. <laughs> so, so he went to from starting at QA tester and then become a developer. So you can see there that it's an entry point to actually start coding. Right. If it is that he was interested in expounding on that skill more and he wasn't like afraid of the complexities and all the troubles, he could have continued down the road of being a senior developer. I'm not picking on you, but hey, I'm picking on you. Um, or he could also become a vulnerability tester. There's a bunch of other stuff that you could actually do. Vulnerability tester is, should have been up here, but there's you can you guys can do the research, but the intention is just to show you that. Once you start out, you can pivot and go into different directions. You can expand your career into becoming a project manager and all those different things. And if you become like a project manager, remember now you have the knowledge of all these sub layers. And so you can make better decisions for the product, for the customers, and also understand at a higher level. So this career path, guys, is just the beginning of it, right? I'm just touching the surface. So make sense so far. Cool. So let's get into what it means to think like a QA. I know we talk about, you know, the different high level processes and all of those different things. Now we're going to focus on a few definitions, right? A few glass returns. This is not the full list, right? My intention is to get you guys started to get the ball rolling, right? So for example, how do you become a QA, right? What, what skills do you need, right? As you notice there, there's nothing there about masters, BSc, or nothing like that. It's just your enthusiasm, right? So first one, you have to be curious, right? You have to constantly think in the back of your mind, um, you know, what's going to happen? You know, I'm no, I hope some of you guys are like me. I think in the worst case scenario, like someone tell me to build this button, I'd be like, you know, what if this button don't work? What, sh what should happen? you know, stuff like that. So you always need to be curious. Don't be like the 99% and just think, okay, I could, this button, it works. Remember that your job is to actually break things. You get commendation when you actually break things, right? Yeah, at, um, attention to detail. So this is a good thing. Like, you know, anybody like them clerks or whatever, you need to enjoy the details. So you need to know that if the button was on the left, if they release the product and the button is now on the right, it will upset the customer. And if you guys remember when Facebook, for example, would change the width of the main interface to a minuscule width, 
everybody complain. And you'd be like, why everybody is complaining? It's because they're used to something um, as predefined as that. When Facebook flipped and moved all the ads over to the right-hand side, I think, everybody was upset. Like, why are you guys messing with our stuff? Which shows that you need to have an attention to detail so your user base don't complain without you actually notifying or noticing it first. The next one is you actually need to enjoy breaking things. I spent a whole bunch of time talking about that earlier. Um, creativity, right? So as the, what this means is that you need to come up with scenarios that business didn't think about. That's what they actually paid you for. So if business is saying that the user need to go from X to Y to Z, you have to be like between X and Y. There could be like some sub points there. What if the user turn upside down? What? Curiosity, just being curious, all right? And be creative in terms of how you think about it. As a QA, you don't have to worry about, okay, folks are saying you're insane. That's not the point. The point is to try and figure out what's going to happen before the user actually gets it. You need to be result oriented as well. So you essentially need to say, okay, I need to figure out if this product is good and you focus on testing this product. Don't be bombarded with, okay, I started testing this. Okay, I want to test this one over here and then I go back and test this thing. No, you need to focus. And once you focus on, on a particular task, you try and get it done, right? What that helps you to do is to fully embed into the application, whatever you're testing, so to speak, and truly understand, is it working accordingly? Remember that at this point, as a QA tester, quality is your friend, right? Timing is also a compromise. And depending on the organization, business normally is trying to rush things, but you have to be result oriented. So if you come in the morning and say, look, I want to test these three things, just try and get those done, right? User centric, meaning you have to think about the user. I know a lot of business, they're going to say, hey, build a product and make sure that we make money. So, you, but that's not your role. That's the role of like the researchers, the analysts and all those folks. Your, 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 your objective is to make sure the product is addictive, make sure the user loves the product. So how do you do that? You have to put yourself in the shoes of the user, right? The next thing you have is you need to, sorry, the next thing you need to be proactive, not reactive. And this is one of the most important points, guys, right? As a QA, yes, things, is, things will go wrong, right? When I was a QA, I messed up a whole bunch of stuff. But the thing was that once I messed up, I actually wrote down like, okay, I messed this up. What did I do wrong? What did I miss? And then no, the next time I make sure it's reincorporated into my learning. So as I go along and I learn new stuff, I continue to develop and I use those patterns. So don't worry about failing, right? That's that's natural part of the job. The, the intention is to always grow. So you start out at one particular point and then in a couple months time you're improving and everything is good because whatever lessons you've learned, you've now applied those. Everything makes sense so far? All right. Now let's focus on a few terminologies, right? Because I think this is one of the things where they say you're talking tech terms. They're using a tech language that most folks don't understand. The, the first one is QA or QC. Both of those are the same thing. Some organizations use QC, some use QA. But essentially what it means is quality assurance or the quality control, right? Whichever one, it doesn't matter. It's just still the same, similar person or group they're refer referring to. SDLC, that's software development lifecycle, that's what we just focused on. Now the next one is a test case, right? Think of a test case as an actual unit of work that you need to verify, right? And a test suite is a group of those test cases, right? I'm gonna show you that in a graph a bit or in, in, a few, in the next slide. Um, test completion criteria. So. What this means is that when you're testing a test case or when you're testing a test scenario, let's use that term instead of test case. What do you consider the test as successful or failure? That is what they're considering as a test completion criteria. So you're saying like, what is required for this story to pass? What is required for this feature to be good? 
that's what you call the requirement or the test completion criteria. Test coverage is basically the total amount of scenarios that you're covering. So if it is that we're testing the banking system now and you just test from um, the, the customer logging into the system, your test coverage will just be users logging into the system. If it is that you're testing the entire thing, your test coverage is the entire thing, right? Hope that making sense so far. This, the next one is test completion report. So, so if it is that the customer is re releasing or about to release a product <clears throat> or you as a user finish testing a feature, one of the things you normally do, you normally have a test completion, hold on, <clears throat> sorry. You normally have a test completion report. Now, what that does is a report that you send to the business. <clears throat> and in that report, <clears throat> Sorry, you're basically telling them that all the features that passed and all the features that failed and what percentage passed versus failed. That's all it is. What it does is give business confidence in terms of where they are, right? It is just essentially you test a bunch of stuff and then you say, this is what passed and this is what failed. Test data. Test data is just that. When you're testing, you don't want to actually use real people's information. So what you want to do is use fake data that you make up, but you want to still cover the scenarios that you're testing. Now that test data, now that test information is what you call the test data, right? It should always be one of the requirements that you have. Next one is test environment. You want to make sure that you're testing in an environment or on a URL that is not the one that you cost, the, the live is live, right? I can talk to you guys a bit more about that, but test environment essentially is just saying that, okay, I have a quality assurance environment. It's more like a copy of production or, and production in this case would be the live UAT. website that everybody can visit. Go ahead. It is now UAT, it is now UAT environment. Yes. Yes, good, good point right there. So you might hear about the term QA or UAT. QA is quality assurance environment, UAT is user acceptance testing, right? You might hear those terms, but they're essentially the same thing. It's just an environment that the testing team is used to verify that everything is good. It's more like they're, you know, like when you're driving through um, the, the, the toll, whenever you stop at a check booth, right? That's their environment. Test execution. This is actually you running an actual test, right? So yeah, you can use a term. Yeah, we're going to run this test. But when you're talking to business, maybe that's a better term to use. It, it doesn't really matter, but it's just that these terms can help you understand what they're talking about. Now, remember I showed you what a test case and a test plan or whatever it is. This is more of a diagram to show you how it's structured, right? So here you can see that the test plan is that high level stuff. So if you have a test plan around the banking system, right, you can then have a suite of test cases around a customer logging in, right, or a customer performing transactions. You can then have a next set of test suite, uh, next suites of test cases that's more tagged around um, a broker logging in, right? Then you can have a next set of test, a next suite of test cases. See, I talk too much. That is our own another feature of the application. But this is not like a set in stone, like it has to be that as I mentioned, like the entire thing. You can have multiple test plans within just a customer um, scenarios, depending on how the application is structured, depending on how business want to do it. Now, test cases now are those steps that you actually test. And each one of those test cases would result in the test with what you'd call a test execution. So you'd actually execute each one of those tests and then you have a test completion report, which would give you a report of the entire test plan. A lot of words make sense so far. Okay, cool. I, I, I thought I messed up that one. <laughs> so here is an example, right? Just to drive home the point. And this is what we're going to always do. Like talk about things, then I show you an example, then we kind of reiterate. So the term here, like for example, a test plan. So testing version one of the shopping app. So just to bear in mind that 
currently I'm building an application for an actual client. No, I'm not faking. I'm telling you, I'm building an application for an actual client. And so that's the application we're going to use to simulate what's happening, to give you guys practical understanding. So what I'm saying here, this is one of the test scenarios that I've created for it, right? We're, we're testing to make sure that the shopping cart is working, the shopping app is working. That's a test plan, right? The test suite in this case is the group we want to categorize to make sure that the account authorization is working. What that means is that the user can log in. Another test, another test suite could be that the testing um, test payment processes. So make sure that if the actual user is checking out an item, they would actually be able to get the, the, the product and, and we, the business, would get the money. Test case is the set of scenarios. So here's an example of one of those scenarios. A set of action used to verify that the feature is working. So in this case, we could say testing that a login action work. And that would come under testing um, user author, testing user account authorization. So let's now take a look at what a test execution plan for one of those would look like. Sorry, test complete. Uh, ah, la, 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 la. I, I, it's a bunch of terms, guys. Test com ah, test completion criteria. You see, even me, even me, I'm missing messing them up at times. So test completion criteria. This is an example of what the test completion criteria would look like in that report that you're giving to business. So the scenario here that we're testing is verify the logging with the customer, um, with customer information. The test steps, which in this case would be the test cases, um, would be navigate to the login page, enter the password and username, and click the login button, right? The expected result is should be able to, should be redirected, uh, should be redirected to the, um, the login page. So once a user is on the main website and they click um, on the logging page or whatever, they should be able to go here. Well, I didn't even know this thing, right? But this should actually be, uh, sorry guys, this should be, should be able to redirect to the home page, which it means that the user successfully log in. Uh, no, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. I'm talking about the wrong scenario. The user should be able to redirect to the login page upon clicking the login button. Right, and the actual outcome in this scenario would be redirecting to the actual login page. Now, if it is that they failed, if it is that you, you test another scenario and they fail, this is what a fail would look like in the red right here. So verify that the home page has products, right? That is the scenario that we want to test. Now, one, the user enter the website in the URL. The expected result should see a list of products on the home page. No, what if they you actually went to the home page and you didn't see anything? You marked, did not display any products. Bear in mind that you don't have to actually use those correct terms. You might see some business say pass or fail, or they use a true or a false. It it varies based on whatever business you're working with. However, the outcome and the information you want to translate is the same. No. There are a list of tools that um, I'm going to reach out to you guys. I'm going to also take your emails so I can show you guys what they look like. And then we can do like a quick session soon around to give you an example of so how to use these tools. So when you go in the working world, they are friendlier. Or if it is that you're not familiar with them, you can become familiar with them. So one of those tools is Jira. And this is normally one of the main tools that companies use to manage the testing or the development life cycle of the application, right? So think about it where the, the developers would actually come into this product, right? It's called Jira, and they would actually um, create the user stories in terms of what they want to develop. Once they finish developing it, they'll move the story over to QA for testing. You as a QA would then verify that that story is good and then move it along the chain until you complete developing the entire product. Think about it as a software development life cycle being done on, a, on an application, on a web application. So it holds everything for the business, right? Soon I'll give you guys an overview of that. The next one is Sonar Cube. So right now, what we've been talking about is 
you manually testing things and making sure it's good. What if um, the next, what if the application becomes complex? What if, you know, you are the only QA person on your team? Or what if you have a bunch of stuff to test? You can't always keep up with those vulnerabilities. So what we have is these, is a set of um, automated tools out there that help you as the QA team to make sure that quality is being maintained. So I think of these are, are like watchdogs, right? One of those is SonarCube. And these products would just be like running in the background to say, hey, there are bugs, there are vulnerabilities. Here is something that's missing. This is the amount of coverage we have in terms of testing. Now, this might be a bit more automated, but the, the idea is just to help QA keep up with the level of work, right? Because one business is going to always be changing the product. The customer might demand something more. And each time the customer demands something more, you as the QA manually might have to go back to test all those features that were released before and make sure that nothing breaks. That's a term that they call regression testing. You have to test everything from, from when it was released back up to what it is now. Versus if you have these tools in place, what they do is they act as a regression testing piece. So these tools will be always running. So once they change something, it runs again and it says, okay, these are the amount of bugs we have, these are the amount of vulnerabilities, these and, and stuff like that. Then you as a QA then manually test the new features as opposed to you have to be doing regression testing on the old features and then the new features. Think about the banking app, like if they're going to manually test everything, every single time they have a release, the QA staff cannot sleep. So these automated tools help us as QA um, personnel to, to accelerate and to make our practice more standardized and more robust. Make sense so far? Okay. The next um, tool out there is what you call JTest. These are essentially tools that the developers would use and the developers would verify that everything is working, right? Some of these tools, you as a QA, if it is that you're, you, you become you know, good in QA and you want to program your testing tools to make sure everything is good, you have a set of tools out there that can help you do that. What that means is that you as a QA can actually code and say, yes, I want my test to work according to these scenarios. You write the code and then you have it run indefinitely. Right, so that means if you move on to another product, your watchdog, so to speak, is there making sure everything is good. One of those tools is called JTest. There are others out there, but this is one of those. The next one that you're going to talk about a lot, um, I probably need to skip back to the previous slide that I showed you where in terms of the career path, you have a, one of those that you call a, um, a stress tester or performance tester. Performance testing is another level of the QA's role. What this means is that if it is that the product is good, meaning everything is working, the buttons that you click, they're working, the user base can actually, um, the user can actually perform whatever activities they want. But there is another level to testing. That level is when a bunch of users hit your website at the same time. Imagine you guys releasing your product today and you're giving everybody free stuff, right? Everybody comes on the application at that point in time. The application is going to break. If it is that the application breaks, what's going to happen is all those users are going to say, yo, this application is good for nothing, boss man. They might give me a free thing and I can't log into the website. That don't make no sense. You as a customer are not going to come back. So this level of testing, which is called performance testing, is there to help you simulate what happens when 50, 100, 10,000, whatever the amount of users you want to test for, hits the website. How does the application respond, right? And at this point, you as a QA engineer can say, wow, this application is not going to work if 50 users hit it at the same time. So let's take off, let's not release this time in this point in time, or let's fix it first, whatever the situation is. And so, these tools can help you as a QA to not only verify that the buttons are working or the features that the user wants are working, 
but the application is working with the load or the amount of users that you want to use to test it. All right. Um, thanks, Solomon. And I want to thank, your, um, thank everyone as well for joining today. Thank you for listening. This is the Palisades Foundation.